the Mac as a space has given me the freedom to be able to make what I want to make. Mac has always been a space that is about new opportunities, being active. We liked people to feel interactive and, and to have it as a place of, of doing and seeing. This is a place where people can come, the doors are open, it's accessible and any given day creativity is just all around it. I'm a huge fan of Birmingham. I live here and I love being here. A big part of that is the Mac and what it is is this real mashing together of cultures and art forms. They're in a pretty beautiful space there in the park. Changing season is all around this centre. People think of Mac as the kind of the heart of Cannon Hill. Mystical, magical experience, you know, walking around Cannon Hill Park and then taking in a show or a movie or a gig. I say we're a little bit like the NHS cradle to grave and everyone comes through our doors at any stage of their lives. We want people to feel at home, but at the same time we do like to challenge people because it's good to have different dialogue that you might not necessarily hear in your own home. There has been a real genuine intention to welcome people. I feel that this milestone that Mac is celebrating in its 60th anniversary is a huge one. It's one that can really look back at its rich history and pick many moments in which Mac can be proud of what it's done both for the local creative landscape and the national creative landscape. Almost exactly 40 years ago, I started my working life here. I was a very junior industrial chemist, and you can see these great pillars there to carry the new motorway, linking all the motorways in Britain. These changes for me are, you know, the really important purpose of the second industrial revolution. To free people to do things other than work. And what are they going to do? That's the question, isn't it? In a sense, Mac is a direct descendant of the Parks Department wartime policies of putting on holidays at home. Because what happened next was people like John English, who didn't have a background in the arts, but loved amateur theatre. He started with his wife, Molly, in putting on events in their large theatre in the parks. Theatre producer, entrepreneur and visionary. His target, children. To revolutionise the lives of children who live in a world dominated by factory chimneys and the noise and dirt of industry. The proposals for the Midland Arts Centre actually started in, in the 1950s and came initially from Councillor Frank Price. Frank Price had grown up in Hockley in uh, really what was quite poor housing. He was the chair of the Parks Department. What he fundamentally wanted was to give people the chance to access the art. And then it was he, Frank, who, who made the connection with John English. The energy, though, was driven by a real sense of common purpose. In one of the very nicest parks in Birmingham, we're building uh, these new kind of, uh, of facilities for leisure time enjoyment. Designs had been drawn up and the plans were very ambitious. But of course, to build something of that nature was going to cost quite a lot of money. It was a major challenge because nobody really knew what this art centre might be like. Nobody had been in such a thing before. I think in the early days, uh, having the support of someone as powerful as Frank Price was absolutely crucial. He was able both to persuade the colleagues in the City Council to give support, to allocate the land. He was able to talk to the trustees of the park and make the changes. And above all, he was able to talk to influential people like Cotton and Beryl Foyle to persuade them to give support to the project. The centre was completely unique at the time and it became a real object of study for people from abroad. People who've got money have given money, people who have got special professional skills have given theirs. Uh, young people, as a rule, haven't got a great deal of money, but they have got enthusiasm and um, 
uh, strengths. Students come each summer to the International Work Camp at the Art Center to build the open-air theater. There are about 10 nationalities this year, building the walls by hand with paving stones given by the city of Birmingham. And in a sense, it became a bit easier, if you like, once they'd got the first buildings finished and opened. And the fact there was a, you know, there's a royal opening, etc., was was just all raising the profile. That moment was a really big moment to mark all of those contributions to making really quite an extraordinary place. This place is for the young people of each new generation. And for all young people, all children, the kids of every Tom, Dick and Harry. And they start coming here when they're very, very young, long before they go to school, with their parents, where we can manage it, with uh, other kids' parents, where we can't. John, why are you doing another horse? Well, I do one every week. That's the only thing I can do. When the centre opened, it was called the Midlands Arts Centre for Children and Young People. The thrust of those early days was very much about participation. Children join the centre and then they can use the workshops to do carpentry or make puppets for the professional puppet theatre, all with expert help and the proper facilities. Youngsters were coming in and they were being artists themselves in close proximity with people who were making puppets to be part of the next puppet theatre show. You wouldn't have expected at that time to go into Birmingham Repertory Theatre, for instance, or to Birmingham Hippodrome and see the artists making the props. But you could hear, and alongside that were professional companies of artists making work for young audiences. John was always very good at, at kind of picking up young talent and, and trying to give it a kick on. It was only about 21 or 22 to have a theatre company with something like 15 or 16 actors in it was enormous it was brilliant and to suddenly be able to direct those actors myself it was like somebody gave me the keys to a Porsche it was a little bit like entering fairyland we were all kind of safe hippies that feeling of the 60s was very prevalent we felt as though we were edgy, even if the organisation was and yet it was that organisation which was allowing and encouraging us to be who we were. A relative amount of freedom going on in the late 60s, for instance, young people staying over at night, getting up to all sorts, the security guard would turn a blind eye and so we talked to people who who found that it was actually a really fertile place. So I think that helped create the, the kind of conditions for things like the Yoko Ono weekend and some of the more experimental theatre that happened here. It's a good place to be conducting the experiment in the Midlands. It's working. They're not really going to know whether it's going to work on the scale one hopes for a long time, perhaps 15 or 20 years, until the little children who were beginning to use the centre now go up, marry, produce their own kids and bring them back. Then we'll know. has so much opportunity. It's a one-stop shop for anything arts related. It's rare, something like this, something that's so versatile with what it does. I genuinely believe that creativity is at the heart of learning. It's so important that people are able to make sense of the world through art through that creativity, often that hands-on, or that opportunity to hear from artists and meet artists, that gives them a different, much broader view of the world. God, getting on the lash down here. <laughs> Where have you come from? The bar. So, <laughs> we started. We're on fire tonight. Gigged here on and off over the last 15 years, helping Barbara Nice with her Christmas shows. Hey, Dad. Behind each year, you're ready to go to one of them new brewery places in Watchers. I'm a regular the cinema here, and they show amazing films here. The art output here is incredible. 
My name is Marion Mohid. I'm an artist and photographer from Birmingham. My work explores my identity as a British Asian Muslim woman. It feels absolutely incredible to have my exhibition here at the MAC. I have grown up visiting the MAC from a very young age and to see that these are the same walls that have my work on there now, it feels really humbling and emotional. I think it's an opportunity I'll never forget in my life that I was given the chance to really tell my own story and to amplify my work. I did not anticipate how grand the launch would be and I think it's because of the team at the MAP who really care about their artists and, and put that effort in to make it accessible for everyone and to promote the event. And I think that's what makes MAC really great. It's always contemporary, it's always relevant to the people in the community. From the 70s, when I first started coming here to the Midland Arts Centre, they, they had a dark room and I was just developing my photography and I used to come. The idea of the people were, you know, what occupied me in those early days. People bringing their food, their culture, their dance, music. I, I think it offers, if you like, a, a place in the Midlands. People will travel here from Dudley, Warsaw, Wolverhampton to see activities that's taking place. So it's a creative hub. I love Mac. You know, it's been part of my uh, life in Birmingham. It's like home to me. It's like coming home, honestly. I led a very full artistic life in India. And when I came to Birmingham, it was... <laughs> I, I had no connections. It was like a cultural desert for me. And I thought, oh my God, I'm going to quietly die in this city. Someone said, oh, there is an art center. You should go and check it out. So I just came along, met somebody here, and started teaching in 1982. It's an amazing meeting place. Sampad was born in this building. You know, at that time, I, I was just an individual dancer and an artist. To have a dream and then to have the support to realize that was 100% because I was here. Many of the key dancers in the country were supported from here. Nahid Siddiqui, Chitraleka Bolar, myself. We've done productions which have brought artists from all over the world here. It was just unex, you know, unexplainable what, how you feel that such luminaries in this building, in that theatre. And I was telling Paul Herbert, who was at that time programming, like, Paul, do you realise how many fantastic big stars of Indian music is sitting in that theatre right now? <laughs> we could have concerts for years. part of our family life really for 20 odd years. So I started off in family pottery with my son. I still got all his funny pots uh, around the house including this one that he, was his very first pot that he made. During my career I was always interested in painting and drawing and I used to sort of dabble, take sketchbooks on holiday and have a go but never really took it seriously so it was only when I retired that I had more time. I thought, well, I may as well try and indulge and see where it goes. What I really love about ceramics, when you're doing it, you're not thinking about schedules, deadlines. It's very meditative. Well, where art has taken me, it's given me a real passion in life. There's a lot of people I've met here who have now become lifelong friends. We were very much encouraged as artist tutors to develop our own work so we could then pass on that knowledge to students. I submitted work to the Royal Birmingham Society of Artists. Much to my surprise, I had three accepted for exhibition. The pottery I've been doing, I was told, was actually quite good. Why don't you try and sell it? So we had an open day once and half the pottery I took along actually sold, which again, 
it was a fantastic experience to know that people actually liked uh, what I was producing. I don't think there's anything quite like it. My friends who visit from other parts of the world or from other parts of the country say, oh, there's nothing, we haven't got anything quite like this here. The 90s, if you like, it's where policies of the 80s, you know, were coming to fruition, really, in many cases. And the arts, in a sense, that having been cut, it doesn't necessarily immediately take its effect. In 1990, when I arrived at MAC, uh, my colleague Jeff and I, just doing a tour of the building, we did a very silly thing. We just pushed against uh, one or two of the window frames to find that they were completely rotten. The reason for having the renovation of MAC was simply that if we didn't, MAC wouldn't exist. The building was crumbling. We wore the building out. And that started us on a journey which actually took from 1992 till 2008. There was a feeling, a sense when we were uh, going for funding, that Mac should stop doing so much, cut down what you do, reduce what you do. We didn't do that. We chose to stay true to the original concept that Mac embraces all art form. So I, I think Mac should never, ever apologise for the breadth and depth of what it does. The major proposition was actually to take out the centre of the building and to make new routes that connected the centre better so that anyone who has limited mobility can get just about anywhere in the centre. Now you can, you just take it for granted and, uh, and that's as it should be really. We completed the project and reopened in two years and having thought that um, maybe our regular customers might have found other things to do in two years. We had over 30,000 of them in on the first weekend. The, the amount of money that regular users of Mac gave was just phenomenal, really inspiring. And to know that you've got that many people's backs is, is brilliant. Mac Makes Music is all about musical inclusion and breaking down those musical barriers that young people with additional needs face. You know what, Mac Makes Music helps me so much doing daily sessions at the Mac, which is a huge creative space for us to collaborate. It actually helps, you know, musicians come out of their shell, come out of their comfort zone. When I listen to music on the radio or at home, I feel like it brings me positivity. It uplifts people in, in a difficult period of time, especially in lockdown. Don't stop thinking about tomorrow. Take the stairs, there's one for sorrow. I'm a rock star slash pop star. Two personalities never play the guitar. We are the Supreme Squad. You better go. I first diagnosed with autism by the age of three. I feel like writing music it is therapy to me and it allows me to express through music. I have my setbacks and struggles, all the obstacles I have to juggle, setting goals, keep my routine in check, all the fake friends I don't show respect. Stop, look and listen, think, respond to all my actions, no reactions. I am so grateful that Matt Makes Music is celebrating 10th anniversary. I'm very proud of the achievements. I'm very proud of the young musician's story. I think they should prescribe it on the NHS. I think we all need music in our lives. One of the reasons I've become a music leader is because I kind of want to impact others the way it impacted me. Because I do believe it's been really life-changing to me. I wouldn't be where I am now without it. I think all anniversaries are a really good opportunity to sharpen the focus of an organisation. 60 years is good. Like I said, we're not a comfy pair of old slippers. We're only just get going. And it's good for the public to recognise that we have been here, Birmingham brand, for 60 years, since 1962. And we have been committed to their cultural welfare from that moment we opened. I just wish the, the Mac all the best 
really, you know, in its future, you know, and the mothers who come in here, you know, it's a godsend to them. And hopefully, it, you know, the youngsters who are coming with them, who they're wheeling in, you know, will one day become artists and creatives. It is about celebrating this amazing success story. It's about celebrating the people here, uh, and it's about celebrating everyone who's walked into these buildings and embraced them. Mac is very good at bringing people together, so I can imagine a huge party. Somewhere like the Mac, you don't get in a lot of places. You wouldn't get this in London, actually. It is very unique to Birmingham, and I will fight to the death for it. Maybe not to the death, but I will. I'll, I'll get close to death. You could. I'd lose a limb for it. And there are very few places that ask you to come as you are and to be the person you are and to learn more about yourself. And in doing so, you learn more about your neighbours and your community. And I think it's incredibly precious space. And that's what art does so beautifully. It gets us together with each other, talking about all the challenges and all the excitements of the future. Mad party, not very sensible. Not serious, no speeches, small speeches. That's on record. If the Mac ever come to me and say, what limb we have in, it's the left leg. You're welcome, Mac. <laughs>